Good morning. My name is Maxine Kaufman, and I have been a covenant member here at Calvary for 53 years. Please open your Bibles with me for today's scripture, reading from Psalm 70. You can find this on page 453 in the Pew Bible in front of you. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, most of you have probably heard these words before at some point in your life. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. That intro to the adventures of Superman has basically everything you need to know about that superhero and his quote-unquote godlike abilities, even if it's a little corny. Little corny. Superman is one of those rare characters. Other superheroes have come and gone, but Superman has withstood the test of time. Ask almost anyone the first superhero that comes to their mind, and most everyone will list off Superman. He made his first appearance in the DC Comics in 1938, and now we have seen his death-defying feats been adapted to the big screen, to novels, films, television shows, even video games. One article stated this, Superman is the archetype of the superhero. He wears an outlandish costume, has or uses a code name, and fights evil with the aid of extraordinary abilities, and doing so all in the name of truth, justice, and the American way. Well, here in Psalm 70 this morning, we hear a statement from the lips of David that rings truer and is far more relevant to the humans in every age that hear this truth. It's more relevant, rings truer than the fantasy of Superman. Here, David declares this one simple truth about God that has massive implications, not only for him in his own personal circumstances, which seem to be rather grim once again, and also this congregation that he's writing to of Israel, but also more relevant and far truer for us today, for you and I. The truth of what David states here in Psalm 70 has basically everything you need to know about God. And it's not corny at all. As a matter of fact, for those who find themselves in similar situations to how David is currently finding himself in, this short affirmation changes absolutely everything. And even though the specific circumstances aren't given to us once again within this psalm, it's not hard to see from a reading of Psalm 70 that David is desperate for God to act. Thus, underneath this concise pronouncement, we uncover not only the depths of David's need, but even more so the extent of God's character. God is great, David declares there at the end of verse 4. God is great. Now, in a society that tends to be enthralled with the numerous fairy tales of superheroes, we can often view true greatness as a fairy tale, as just some myth. This is all the more compounded by the way we just throw around that word, great. I would imagine that this week, or maybe this last 
past couple weeks, at some point, you had a great meal, right? And you weren't, you weren't ashamed at all to tell someone about that great meal that you had. We've also seen in athletic events a great play on the field or the court. We've told someone they've done a great job, and the list of ways that we weaken that word go on and on. You see, if everything is great, then what actually is? Perhaps this is why we believe we have to be our own heroes in life. I mean, since superheroes are just fictional, and anything or anyone can be great, well then, I might as well just try harder and do better on my own. Which means when I find myself in cir- circumstances like David finds himself, and in a place where he's out of control out of the things that he should be in control with, well then, like David, if I'm finding myself in that situation, then I better just hero up. I've got to be great. And David, however, knows how futile our personal quest for greatness really are. For if you remember in his story, he's been put in some very interesting circumstances. He couldn't do it on his own, even if he just tried a little harder. A bear, a lion, a giant named Goliath, King Saul and his posse, even his own sons. David has had some rather, rather formable foes throughout his life, and Yet, as we've seen throughout our study of the Psalms and even our study of the Psalms this summer, David's confidence and hope are not centered on his own capacity to handle it on his own. No, David's confidence, his hope is centered on God and his power over all things. He knows he's not the hero. God is. And so you see, here's the truth that David has learned throughout his lifetime and the truth that we see him specifically resting in here as he pens these words of the 70th Psalm. The truth that God is great, so we don't have to be in control. God is great, so we don't have to be in control. And it's this simple Yet profound truth that becomes the ballast for David in the midst of the out-of-control circumstances of his life. When the winds roar and the waves crash, David rests in this truth that God is great, and so he doesn't have to be in control. He doesn't have to be the hero. God already is. And so this morning as we study this psalm together, I want to draw your attention to three things. The need the crowd, and then the hero. The need, the crowd, and the hero. Let's begin our study this morning by noticing the need. In verses one through five, the need for deliverance and help. If your home is anything like ours, I'm sure over the last even couple weeks, you've heard someone yell out at some point, hurry, I need someone to help me. Now, What comes next in that statement is vitally important to both the one requesting help and the ones requested. You see, if someone says, hurry, I need someone to help, and then they talk about the laundry, well then, the pace of how someone's going to come and help is not all that fast, is it? Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some sluggishness that's going on in that hurry to help with the laundry, some slowness, especially by the children, and if I'm honest, myself, uh, I'm not going to go that fast. But if I hear, hurry, I need someone to help, and I know that they are grabbing that piping hot pizza out of the oven, and it's about to fall onto the floor, well, you better believe I am going to be there immediately to save the day. Hurry, I need someone to help. Now, of course, there's more significant reasons that you might hear that in your home, but you get the idea. The request for help is amplified by our tone, yes, but even more so by the words that we say. Specifically, this word hurry, for in that word hurry, there's a sense of urgency that comes with it. Normally, you don't say hurry and then expect to wait 
for 30 minutes or more for action. Did you notice David's words here in verses 1 and 5? Look at them once again. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. And then in verse 5, but I am poor, ne- poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. O Lord, do not delay. What David is essentially saying here within these verses is hurry. I need someone to help now. He's expecting action. He's needing help. David wants God to come now. There's a sense of urgency in his words and in his tone. David Kidner notes, the petitions emphasize the urgency of the matter. There's not a moment to lose, or so, at least it appears from ground level. You see, from David's perspective on life, he's in need of help in that very instant. Waiting is not going to be an option here. He needs assistance now. But let's just be honest with ourselves. I don't, I don't mind saying hurry to my children in a certain si- situation at home. Hurry, come, quick. I'll even say that to Megan at times, again, in specific situations. Even as I look across the room, there are some of you that I wouldn't mind saying, hurry, come, help now. But God? I mean, can we really talk to God like this? Is this okay for us to emulate? I mean, if David can say, hurry, God, shouldn't we be able to say it as well? Well, here's the thing. We have to notice here in this psalm, as well as in many of the other psalms where we hear these kind of bold statements from David, that David's not telling God to hurry from a position of authority here. Rather, he's, qu- he's requesting God's quick action from a position of surrender. He's not calling for God to hurry from a position of authority, but a position of surrender, and the tone makes all the difference, doesn't it? And David's not standing here, arms crossed, saying to God, come on, hurry up. Come on, you got to act here. No, he's on his knees or maybe even flat on his face because of his circumstances. And he's crying out to the only one who can actually do something about it. This is not a demand. No, this is desperate dependence. For David is poor and needy which has to be hard for him to admit as a man and as the king who has essentially everything at his disposal. But he knows that he is poor and needy. He has found himself out of control in a situation where he should be in control. And so he begins to pray these bold and confident prayers. Hasten to me, O God. Hurry. This is David's need. He needs deliverance. He needs help now. But what is it that is causing David to plead for help with such urgency here? Well, as we look into verses 2 through 4, we begin to discover the answer, along with noticing a stark contrast here within the crowd. So not only do we see the need here in Psalm 70 for deliverance and help, but we see the crowd. Look at Verses 2 through 4, once again. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Have you or your children ever been so upset about a situation that you're all out of sorts and don't make any sense, especially when the kids come running to you? Uh, They come running to you and they start speaking and you're trying to figure out what they're saying in that moment because they're so upset. Unfortunately, I've experienced this strange occurrence in my children a couple, okay, if I'm honest, several times. Pastor kids are sinners too. I know. Dad, you need to punish them. Dad, they took blah, blah, blah and did blah, blah, blah. About all you can make out of your children as they're running to you is punish them, took, did, who, 
What? What happened here? I'm not the only one, right? I'm not the only one that have ex- experienced that. And what do we do as good parents in that instant? We calmly say, okay, who? Who did this? Who was it? What, what happened there? Who is the they that took? Who is the they that did? Well, did you notice what David is doing here in these words? I'm mean, look again at verses, uh, verse two and three. Each of those lines start off with, let them be put to shame. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor. Let them turn back because of their shame. It appears David has a case of all out of sorts. He's upset, as one commentator notes. He places the verbs in the first position and the subjects in the last position, revealing how he is desperate for God to act. And David is so desperate, he's speaking in short bursts. And so we really don't get the full story right away. He's emphasizing the punishment. Let them be put to shame. Let them be turned back. Let them be brought back because of their shame. He's emphasizing the punishment before revealing the crime or the criminal. So we might ask David, who's them? Who's them? Well, once we get the full picture within these verses, it's not pretty. The them, to which David eventually points out are those who seek his life, who delight in his hurt and say, aha, aha. This is the them. This is what they are doing. They're seeking his life, delighting in his hurt, saying, aha, aha. Lex Luthor, the Joker, Captain Hook, Darth Vader. Every superhero fantasy has a villain. Unfortunately, in David's story at this time, he has villains too, opponents. And the interesting thing is about the background of Psalm 70 is that we start to find out as we study a little further who this opponents are. Most commentators note that the first book of the Psalms, which start in Psalm 1 through Psalm 41, are a record of David's early life recorded for us in 1 Samuel, marked most by the persecution that he faced with King Saul. And so we will find ourselves in Psalm 40, again, towards the end of that first book of the Psalms, and we hear David declares in Psalm 40 almost the same exact thing, word for word, that we find here in Psalm 70. In fact, if you would, turn back to Psalm 40 real quick and notice the similarities. Starting in verse 13, again, this is the end of David's early life, as he had been pursued by King Saul. Verse 13 of Psalm 40 said, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Did you hear those similarities? The second book of the Psalms starts then in Psalm 42 and goes through Psalm 72, following David's later days in his life, his final days of life, which means What we have here in Psalm 70, as well as in Psalm 71, which 70 is kind of an introduction to 71, is both a response to and a a call of remembrance from David during his persecution by his sons, Absalom and Adonijah, recorded for us in 2 Samuel 15 through 19 and 1 Kings 1. You see, David knows what persecution holds in life. He knows what it looked like with King Saul, and in this moment, he is likely experiencing persecution by even his own sons. They are the one who are seeking his life, who are delighting in his hurt. And so what he's doing here in Psalm 70 is he's calling to mind what happened in the past to assure him of what will happen in the present. He knows God is great, so he doesn't have to be in control, in the past. He's experienced that in the early days of his life. And so you even notice at the very beginning of Psalm 70, this says, to the choir master of David for the memorial offering or for remembrance. 
Again, this is the way David is preaching this truth about God's greatness to himself. He's looking in the past and he's saying, God was great then, God is great today. The opposition has changed, but God has not. For great is the Lord. God is great. But we also notice within these verses, as David is calling to memory the greatness of God, he's also calling to mind the stance of the faithful. And in doing so, we see this sharp distinction between his opponents, the villains, and God's covenant people, the faithful. The villains are the ones that are seeking his life, delighting in his hurt, saying, aha, aha. The faithful seek the Lord, rejoice in And are glad in God and say, God is great. Do you see the contrast? I mean, what a contrast in actions, seeking his life versus seeking the Lord. Beliefs, delighting in his hurt versus rejoicing, delighting in God. And then in words, saying, aha, I gotcha. And saying, God is great. David is assuring himself that even though his own offspring are out to get him, he's not alone. God's people, those who love his salvation, are those in whom he finds comfort. The people of God who are rejoicing and are glad in God, this is what they are known for. Loving God, rejoicing, a gladness in God. They are his true family in the midst of his oppression and neediness. You see, friends, this is what we are to be as God's people. This is what we are to be as the church for one another, as family, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to be those who come alongside of one another in the moments of despair and distress, weeping with those who weep and pointing each other to the greatness of our God. Not encouraging one another to try harder, do a little better, the next time on your own, but lifting up one another's chins and saying, look to Christ, the author, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, he has already won the victory for us. God is great. You see, we do this as a faith family on Sundays as we gather together to seek him and be glad in him as we sing and rejoice in the truth. His love is my reward. Oh, fear is gone. Hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. He is yours forevermore. You see, we help others find joy in Jesus because we have found our joy in him. So we do that here on Sundays, and we do this throughout the week when we text one another. We make a call, meet for coffee, Gather in each other's homes and stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as the author of Hebrews says, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as we see that final day drawing near. You see, the church is not a self-help center. It's a gospel-centered community of disciples on mission saying evermore, God is great. God's the hero. We're not the heroes of our stories. God is. Which leads us to our final observation from this psalm this morning, which is the hero, our great God. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, states that what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so we have to ask, what comes into our mind? When we think about God, do we think about his greatness? Then he goes on in the preface of that book to lament the loss of the concept of God's greatness within the church today. He writes, the church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted for one so low, so ignoble as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, namely worshiping men. This low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. In other words, what Tozer is saying, and I believe what David shows us here in Psalm 70 and then throughout the Psalms, we find it throughout Scripture, is that our view of God is linked 
to the way we live and the way we deal with unvited circumstances in our lives. So we may believe in the sovereignty of God on Sunday, but then on Monday, when we're overwhelmed and anxious about our week, we have to wonder if we actually truly believe that God is great. We may say we believe he's supreme, but we actually live like we are. That we're supreme. We're the ones that are supposed to be in control. And what David is doing here in Psalm 70 is reminding himself and others of the simple truth that God is grace, great, so we don't have to be in control. And that's good news for us, isn't it, church? It's good news that our God is bigger than our problems. He's in control over the circumstances we find ourselves even right now today. He is greater. God spoke and the stars jumped to order. God spoke and creatures came to be. One author writes, as he reminds us of the splendor of God's creation, a caterpillar has 228 separate and distinct muscles in its head. The average elm tree has approximately 6 million leaves on it. Our heart generates enough pressure as it pumps blood throughout your body that it could squirt blood up to 30 feet. Sorry to anyone who just got queasy by that, especially my cousin Matt, who happens to be here today. But that's pretty incredible, isn't it? 228 separate distinct muscles. An elm tree has 6 million leaves on it. And when we behold the greatness of our God, when we pick up a tiny caterpillar, we hold one simple fallen leaf. We look into the eyes of a newborn baby and we see the greatness of the creator, God. The greatness of God is easy to believe, that is, until things aren't going our way. When we're running late for work, it seems like we're hitting all the red lights. Traffic's moving extra slow. We believe in the greatness of God, that is, until the kids are emptying the shelves in the grocery store along with us as we're trying to pick out what to eat for that night. We believe God's great until the car overheats and when the ch child is born way too early. It's then that we begin to bristle. We start to doubt God's greatness, his control over our lives. Friend, what is it in your life that you are trying to control? If I'm honest, I'd have to answer everything. I try to control every area of, a lot of my life because I believe it's up to me. I've got to make it happen. I've got to do it on my, my own, try a little harder. And so then when I find myself without control over a situation, I start freaking out, getting impatient, overbearing, frustrated. But then when things seem to be going well for me, then I believe I've got control over the situation. I get a little self-righteous about how good life is going. Why? I mean, why do we do this? Well, I believe we do this because we're believing a lie about God and then about ourselves. We're living with the illusion that we have control over our lives and that God isn't as powerful, isn't as great as he actually says he is. The reality is I have zero control. I'm not great. I am not the hero. God is. And that's exactly why we need this good news here from Psalm 70 because God is great and so I don't have to be in control. He is the hero. You see, David had learned that truth throughout his life. He wasn't the hero over the lion or the bear. He wasn't even the hero over Goliath. God was. And yet the truth is, the greatness of our God, revealed through the life of David, is not enough to fully describe his greatness and his power. For that, we need another story. The story of Jesus. The story of one who was born of a virgin in a humble cattle stall. The all-powerful, confined to the human form of a baby. The story of the one who showcased his power by calming the storms on the Sea of Galilee, who turned water to wine, healed the leper 
and the blind. The one who fully submitted to God's greatness and will and through tears and drops, the sweat drops like blood, wept in the garden, Father, your will be done, not as I will, but as you will. You see, God's ultimate power was displayed on the cross and in the empty tomb. There, Christ took our sin, our shame. He restored a relationship, made it possible for us to be right with God once again through his death and resurrection. See, that is the story. That is the good news for us this morning. God is great. God is great. And so, friend, if you're here this morning and you find yourself in a circumstance that just seems overwhelming in life, and you say, you know what? Pastor Dan, I've been trying to do it on my own. I've tried to make things better. I've been trying to make my life better. Well, friend, God is great. You're not. God is great. And because of Jesus, you can come and bow your knee to God. God will redeem you, will forgive you if you turn to him in faith and repentance. And I can't promise you that then, from this point on, you'll be in control of everything, but I can promise you that God will be in control. He is great, so you don't have to be in control. Christ is the power and wisdom of God, the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature, the one who sustains all things by his powerful word. Paul describes Christ in these words. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him and in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. Do you hear the greatness of God? Jesus is the Lord of all. And he runs life best. This is the good news for us today. Oh, may we respond to this simple yet profound truth as David does by bold and confident prayers. May that be the rhythm of our life even this week. In those moments where we feel like it's out of control again. The kids, I just can't handle it anymore. The, the boss at work, I don't know what's he, what he's doing. God, hurry to help me. I need your help. I know you're great in this instance. Show me your greatness. May we pray those bold, confident prayers. May we be faith-filled in our rejoicing, our delight in him. You know what? Many times we say we have joy in Jesus, but then we walk around like everything is awful. Our faces don't show what we've just said. May we be those who rejoice and are glad, who love his salvation, and then be those who live out expectant praise. We know God is great in the past, and because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, I know he's great today, and so I am going to say evermore, God is great.